Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad that you've joined us today for our third session in our series for a Synodal Church Communi Communion, Participation and Mission. So today we welcome again, Bishop uh, Douglas Crosby, OMI, Bishop of Hamilton and Chair of the Episcopal Commission for Evangelization and Catechesis. Uh, this morning, we learned from the Vatican that Bishop Crosby had been appointed as a member of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacrament. So congratulations, Bishop. That's wonderful news. Uh, so I'm, I'll turn it over to you then to lead us in prayer and uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. And, and thanks for the, uh, the acknowledgement. It was quite a surprise this morning. Uh, and thank you also for the work you've done in, in just uh, planning and organizing these uh, three uh, these three sessions on synodality, which have uh, really uh, opened up the uh, our whole understanding and, uh, and uh, very well done. Good turnout of good turnout of people interested in in the webinar and well done. I'm going to say the Atsumas prayer, which has been uh, which has been recrafted for uh, the Senate. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity, so that we may journey together to eternal life, and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you, who are at work in every place and time, in the communion of the Father and the Son, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So it is uh, my privilege and my pleasure to introduce His Eminence, Cardinal Gerald Cyprian Lacroix, Archbishop of Quebec and Primate of Canada. Born in 1957 in a small farming town in the beautiful Beauce region of the province of Quebec, Young Gerald Lacroix and the Lacroix family emigrated to Manchester, New Hampshire in the United States. And there he developed his beautiful Franco-American accent and graduated from Trinity High School. He began his college education at St. Anselm College. In 1976, he joined the Pius X Secular Institute, which I'm happy to say it was founded by an oblate of Mary Immaculate. So he knows of the missionary charism of the oblates. He made his first vows in 1976 and his final vows in 1982. He graduated with a Bachelor of Theology degree from Laval University in 1985 and was ordained a deacon on March 25, 1988 and a priest later that year, October the 8th. For the next eight years, the young priest was a missionary in Colombia, pastor of Nuestra Señora del Carmen Parish in the Archdiocese of Popayan. He was a very active priest in Popayan, a missionary in every way. And during that time, he obtained his Master of Pastoral Theology degree from Laval University. We can say that he is a lifelong learner. When he returned to Quebec, he was elected Director General of the Pius X Institute from 2001 to 2011. He was President of the National Office of the St. Andrews School of Evangelization in Canada and a member of the Board of Directors of the World Conference of Secular Institutes. The missionary dimension of mission ministry is in his DNA. In 29, 2009, he was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of Quebec by Pope Benedict XVI. And just a year later, in 2010, he was appointed Diocesan Administrator of the Archdiocese. And on March the 25th, 2011, he was installed as the 25th Bishop and the 15th Archbishop of Quebec. 
and drum rolls. On January 12, 2014, Archbishop Lacroix was created Cardinal by Pope Francis. Cardinals are created. <laughs> and on May 22nd, he received the red hat in the ring. Cardinal Lacroix is on several Vatican congregations and commissions and committees supporting the important work of Pope Francis. And when he was invited to speak on this webinar, he accepted readily, ask a busy man. Thank you, Your Eminence, for your leadership in Canada and your strong support of Pope Francis. Thank you for sharing your insights on the missionary dimension of the Synod. We are all ears. Eh bien, bonjour à tout le monde. Just, merci, Monseigneur Douglas Crosby, pour uh, le moment de prière et votre introduction. I have been asked to speak in English. Uh, I thank you for your mercy and indulgence. I am not, uh, this is not my native tongue, but I, I think I can manage and I hope to uh, be able to share what uh, I have prepared in a very simple way. I'm a simple man. <clears throat> Uh, I cannot see anyone, but I know you're there from all over the country. I saw just before entering, there were people from Vancouver Island and uh, probably some from many other provinces of our wonderful and great country. I'm speaking to you from Quebec City and uh, very happy to be part of this adventure. Pope Francis has declared that Synodality is what God expects of the church in the 21st century. He has put his own transformative stamp on the meaning and conduct of synods, saying that a synod involves mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. The synod that we have begun to experience is unlike any other. From 2021 to 2023, at least, it will be a journey of sharing, reflecting, and listening at all levels across the entire church. But what is exactly a synod? I know most of you have been uh, very involved, uh, maybe in your own diocese and, and communities and know all about this. Maybe others are are not as uh, as involved and that's why I want to I want to briefly uh, talk about what is a synod and why we have come to this and how we're going to make it to speak about the mission of the church. A synod is a gathering traditionally of bishops that helps the church to walk forward together in the same direction. The word synod comes from the Greek syn odos meaning the same way or the same path walking together on that same path. Synods were common in the first centuries of Christianity, giving bishops the opportunities to meet and discuss issues of importance for the life of the church. After the experience of the Second Vatican Council, which allowed over 2,000 bishops from all over the world to participate, in 1975, uh, Pope Paul VI instituted the Synod of Bishops at the universal level of the church. He wanted a way of consulting the fraternal collegial exchange that had been experienced at the Second Vatican Council, where bishops from across the globe had gathered together between 1962 and 1965. Since then, synods have been organized about every three years, bringing together bishops, experts, various delegates to discuss topics on a variety of topics that have to do with our church and our mission, the Eucharist, the Word of God, sometimes on regions like the Middle East or uh, the Amazon, on new evangelization, the family, young people, among many other themes. In each case, bishops vote a final document and then the Pope writes his own text, which we, are, which we call an apostolic exhortation. To open new pathways and shed new light on what was discussed at the Synod. So that it can radiate across the entire church. Fundamentally, synodality is about journeying together. This happens through listening to one another in order to hear what God is calling to all of us 
what he is saying and calling us to be. It is realizing that the Holy Spirit can speak through anyone to help us walk forward together on our journey as the people of God. The point is not that we take two years to understand some new buzzword that will soon fade, because synodality is no passing phase. Rather, walking together is at the heart of what the church is all about. As the people of God on pilgrimage in the midst of the world, this is how we live. Or at least this is what we are called to live. This is how we live and experience our mission. In the days of the early church, St. John Chrysostom said that for him, church and synod were synonyms. Since the church is all about walking together. In this sense, synodality is a way of renewing the church from her deepest roots in order to be more united with one another and better carry out our mission in the world. Concretely, being synodal is a way of being in a way of working that takes a more grassroots collaborative approach, taking time to discern the path forward together. It highlights the fact that we all have something precious to contribute to the body of Christ. In this way, a synodal church is a church that listens. It is a mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. The lay faithful, the bishops, the pope, all listening to each other and all listening together to the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth in order to know what he is saying to the church. This will naturally call us to change our ways of doing things in order to become more and more who we are truly are, a church. Walking together admits, amidst the entire human family, humanity guided by the Holy Spirit. So we may ask, why a synod on synodality? Yes, a synod on synodality may seem like a kind of like having a movie about movies or a book about books. But don't worry, this isn't just some complicated mind trick. Rather, it's an invitation for the whole church to have our voices heard, everyone's voice heard. We can only move forward if we work and walk together. No Christian is an island. Every limb and appendage is necessary in the body of Christ. Through this synod, the church is saying, the voice of everyone matters because God can talk through anyone. Not only bishops, priests, deacons, brothers or sisters, but through all of us. We are not only called to listen to each other, but to work together in communion and participation. That is the fruitful path to mission. Now, I know in the first two sessions you've had in your other webinars, you dedicated a lot of time on those two themes, communion and participation. Pope Francis has stated that this collaborative, inclusive approach of synodality is precisely the path that God expects of the church in the third millennium. This is truly a revolution of the Holy Spirit towards the church that God is calling us to be for tomorrow, but starting today. Of course, synodality is complicated to spell, but let me tell you, it is even more challenging to put it into practice. This is the whole point of the two-year synod that the church began last October, helping the whole church to walk together, to walk forward together, united in the mission we share. This begins by paying attention to those who are often forgotten or excluded or not listened to, hearing what God has to say to us through those we may ignore or differ in opinion or way of thinking. 
the path to a church that listens and walks together starts with you and me. Let's walk forward together. We know that this is what we have to do, but we know we need to learn how to do this. The Holy Father, Pope Francis, honestly believes that walking together, we will learn how to do this, so this will become for us a way of life. We all know and often quote the missionary mandate that Christ left to his disciples after his resurrection and before his ascension that we find in Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's pretty clear, no? Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. But how are we going to do that? It all seemed clear and easy when the disciples were with Jesus, listening and watching him interact with people. But as they went out of Jerusalem, out of Galilee, out to an unknown world, a pagan world, where other gods were worshipped, things got more complicated, obstacles, challenges, not only from the people they were sent out to meet and evangelize, but also among themselves in the emerging communities. This is where synodality will step in as an inescapable way of living the mission of the church. Now, if we go back to the Council of Jerusalem, that is generally dated to 48 AD, it is the cornerstone for the assertion that synods, synodality, are the oldest forms of church governance. We clearly see in the Acts of the Apostles how the church gathered to listen, to pray, to discern, so as to be able to continue living the mission entrusted by Christ. But that claim is further validated by the emergence as early as the second century of numerous synods across the Roman world. In that century alone, we have evidence of at least 50 such gatherings in Palestine, North Africa, Gaul, and elsewhere. From that time forward, synods became a standard feature of church life. There were a minimum of 400 synods between the 2nd and 7th century. The Council of Nicaea had, in, in fact, decreed that bishops should hold synods twice a year. And the Council of Trent, as part of its reform of the episcopacy, ordered every bishop to hold a synod annually in his diocese. Over the centuries, the pace varied, but remained vigorous. In the 19th century, the synods diminished after the definition of papal primacy at the First Vatican Council, but they were never completely or entirely died out. One of the first things that the future Pope John XXIII did when he became Patriarch of Venice was to call a diocesan synod. That brings us to the present and to Pope Francis. Although he is the first pope in 50 years not to have participated at Vatican II, he has a profound appreciation of the council and the transforming scope of the decrees as he showed unmistakably when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires. Two aspects of the council pertinent to synodality that he particularly appropriated are the Council's description of the Church as the people of God, and its wide-ranging insistence on a collegial mode of Church governance. Its signature statement in that regard occurs in the third chapter of Lumen Gentium, which describes the collegial relationship between the bishops and the Pope. But in, other, in another document, or other documents, the Council helped up held up the ideal of a collegial relationship between the bishop and his priests and between priests and their people. Pope Francis is also deeply persuaded that the people of God 
have a profound grasp of the faith and practice of the church. And therefore, the people must be listened to. This is not an idea peculiar to Francis, this, but it is a standard part of the Catholic heritage, nicely expressed in the Latin phrase, sensus fidelium, perhaps best rendered in English as the faithful's sense of the faith. With that, we have the essential background for understanding what synodality is and why the Pope is eagerly promoting a more synodal church. Synodality is the revival of the oldest tradition of church governance, and therefore the Pope's revival of it, it is in itself altogether traditional and yet prophetic for our time. In the past, participants in synods have been restricted to small numbers, no matter how varied the participants' state in life. Today, Pope Francis wants all members of the church to express their faith and their hopes and desires for the church. The preparatory documents for the church-wide synod provide for the inclusion even of non-Catholics and non-Christians. There has never been an exercise of collegiality with such an unqualifiedly inclusive invitation. Unlike past synods, this one isn't about addressing a particular issue, but about becoming who God calls us to be as a church, all of us together amidst the reality of today's world. The synod that began in October of last year, 2021, is totally unprecedented for at least three reasons. It is no longer only three weeks or a month synod of bishops in Rome, but a two-year synodal process for the entire people of God, all the baptized. All are invited and no one is to be left behind or excluded. Secondly, it is a synod that aims on giving the entire church a lived experience of synodality. It's not just about filling in a questionnaire, answering some questions, consulting a few people, but gathering the fruits of what the Holy Spirit is saying to us here and now. And thirdly, the aim of the Synod is not just to talk about synodality, but to put synodality into practice from now onwards in a new way, in every diocese, parish, group, association, consecrated life, community, and country across the whole world. It is about a shared experience to live our mission. This calls us, all of us, at every level of the church, to renew our way of being and working together moving forward. It is not just an event, but also a process that involves in synergy the people of God, the College of Bishops, and the Bishop of Rome, each according to their proper function. Pope Francis, for Pope Francis, synodality is a way of communicating and relating. It is the way he sees the three parts of the church, the people of God, the College of Bishops, and the Bishop of Rome, the Vicar of Christ, in constant exchange together, all three parts listening. The key is to pray and discern what the Holy Spirit is saying at this point in history by listening to each other, by listening to the word of God, to the Lord, by listening to his spirit. Let me share with you an experience that was inspired for me from this synodal process that we lived here in our Diocese of Quebec last December. Probably like in all of your provinces and regions, uh, the pandemic, the, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us pretty hard. Uh, we were hoping as October and November were advancing 
that finally this year we would have a more normal Christmas. Being able to celebrate uh, in our churches, we have not been able to do that for two years, or very restricted with very small numbers. This year we were looking to have at least 250 persons allowed in our in our churches, and everybody was very enthused. Choirs had practiced and everything. But early December, another wave of, of people who were infected by this uh, COVID uh, virus was coming out. The, December 12th, 14th, 18th, hospitals were already overflowing. Intensive care units were full. We did not know how to de do where to put people. Many people were dying. And we were wondering, should we celebrate Christmas in our churches this year? Add to that and to those difficulties the fact that from late September or early October, the government of the province of Quebec uh, requested that anyone who entered restaurants or many other places, uh, auditoriums, uh, places for concerts and churches, places of worship, the requirement that we had to present proof of our vaccines to be able to enter. That was very difficult for our people. It was like, no, you're not vaccinated, you can't come in. So that was already quite a big question. So with our team, our diocesan team, we decided that we would live a synodal experience. We didn't tell them that that's what we were going to do, but that's what we did. So December 20th, in front of all these, this reality, uh, we decided to invite all the pastors, all the people in charge of all the parishes of the diocese to a Zoom meeting. We couldn't gather them in the same place, the distances, but also the, the, the situation of COVID. So we had a 7.30 in the morning meeting that lasted one hour and 45 minutes. And uh, we started by praying together with the word of God. And then I exposed the reality. I said, now listen, we need to see what is happening around us and listen to each other and take, make a decision. And I explained how difficult the situation was. And I, I knew that the government was uh, thinking seriously about closing everything for Christmas and New Year's, including places of worship. The decision had not been taken yet, but we were going in that direction. So I said, what should we do? Should we still hold our celebrations knowing that this new uh, wave of, of, uh, of uh, COVID uh, is very, very contagious. Many people were sick. Every day we were learning another priest, a religious uh, a choir master, an organist, uh, a sacristan. Should we or should we decide to close our churches for this period? So I says, this is the situation. Let's listen to each other. We prayed. Let's listen. So everyone could talk. So we listened for a long period. Some said, Bishop, listen, this is the first Christmas. We're going to be able to go back to church. This is not a time to close. People want to come. We need to come. We're, this is, we can't close our churches. Everybody is ready. Our nativity sets, our choirs, our liturgies. We can't do that. Okay, next one. Another one said, well, you know, I'm very worried. We have a social responsibility also. If we have people coming in at 250 for this very festive and beautiful celebration, of course they're gonna to wanna to shake hands, hug each other, be close. Uh, are we gonna to contribute to more contamination to this virus? The people who work in, 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 in hospitals and hospices are already overloaded. Are we gonna to contribute to that? I wonder if we shouldn't abstain from and close our churches. So we listened to everybody. There were opinions on all sides from every perspective. After we listened to all those who wanted to speak, I said, okay, we've listened to each other. Now let's take a three, four, five minutes of silence. After all we've heard, what should we do? What is the Lord telling us through this? 
what is our perspective, our discernment? And after a few minutes, I'll ask you and we'll do a second round. So we did that. Four or five minutes in silence in front of your computer screen is long. We just waited and prayed. And, and then I said, okay, now everyone, after all we've heard, what would you like to say? What do you recommend? What decision should we take? Ultimately, as the bishop, I will have to make a decision. But I need your input. And so we listened. Most of the brothers, most of the people who were there said, you know, as difficult as it is to even think of not celebrating Christmas in church, I think this is the right thing we need to do this year and find another way to help people celebrate in their homes and not spread more of this virus. This is going to be a very difficult, this situation, but this is what we need to do. Others said, well, I, I'm not so sure, but after listening to everyone, um, I've shifted my way of thinking. I think we should go. Finally, most people thought that we should close, although it was very difficult, although it's going to be very criticized, but this is the right thing to do. So I said, okay, thank you. I will continue praying and 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 asking the Lord to, to help me make the right decision, but you've been very helpful. And at the end, I said, you know, what we've done is a synodal experience. We've listened to God, his spirit, his word. We listen to each other, not just to argue, but to discern. And that's what we did. And the next day, I sent out a, a, a communique that said, well, after having done this, we have decided with a lot of sadness, but we're doing this for the right reason to shut our closed churches down from December 23rd till after New Year's to let this wave go by. The people who work in hospitals, in homes, who accompany the sick, who are so tired and overworked, we're so thankful that we did this. Of course, we were criticized also by people who said that we were depriving them of the grace of God. But most people said, for those reasons, we can make the sacrifice of not going to church. We'll celebrate Christmas at our home for this year, and we'll, we can continue later. That was a very difficult thing to do in a very short time. But the synodal process of listening sharing, discerning together, gave me the authority and gave me the courage to make this very difficult decision. So you see, the key is to pray and discern together. And I think the Holy Father wants us to learn to do that more and more. The Pope would like us to meet together to see how we can better travel together and live our mission. The question of the Holy Father is posing with the Synod is, how are we doing this? Is our way of living our daily lives in our church allowing us to exercise the mission of the church, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to bring people to encounter the living God, and to learn to follow him as disciples, and to become missionary disciples? I have participated so far in three synods in Rome on three different topics. The first one was I was a young archbishop in 2012 on new evangelization and the transmission of the Christian faith. It was presided by Pope Benedict XVI, his last synod. I was, as you would say, a new kid on the block participating for the first time in such an international gathering of cardinals, bishops, priests, consecrated men and women, theologians, experts, laymen and women, ecumenical participants, a wonderful experience of the universal church, but a bit intimidating for me. The second synod was in 2015 on the family. It was Pope, Bened Pope Francis's first experience as Pope presiding this three-week event in the Vatican. 
I was moved by the introductory remarks of His Holiness Pope Francis. He said, and I quote, as we know, the Synod is a journey undertaken together in the spirit of collegiality and synodality, on which participants bravely adopt parousia, freedom of speech, pastoral zeal and doctrinal wisdom, frankness, always keeping before our eyes the good of the church, of families, and the welfare of the people to save souls. I should mention that the Synod, this is the Pope again, I should mention that the Synod is neither a convention nor a parlor, a parliament nor a Senate, where people make deals and reach a consensus. The Synod is rather an ecclesial expression, the church that journeys together to understand readily with the eyes of faith and with the heart of God, it is the church that questions herself with regard to her fidelity to the, to the deposit of faith, which does not represent for the church a museum to view, nor just something to safeguard, but is a living spring from which the church drinks to satisfy the thirst of and illuminate the deposit of life. The synod works necessarily within the bosom of the church and of the holy people of God, to which we belong in the quality of shepherds, which is to say as servants. I remember vividly how there were a lot of strong opinions all through that synod. You may remember those years. There were two, two years, an extraordinary synod and a, a regular synod. People lobbying to gather people around specific ideas. It felt like a certain degree of a political, a polite political campaign to assure votes when came the time to vote on proposals on all the related topics pertaining to the family. Who was going to win? Many ideas, not enough people listening. Then I was in, invited to participate in a third synod in 2018 on young people, the faith and vocational discernment. Again, the Holy Father offered opening remarks and I quote, the synod is an ecclesial exercise in discernment to speak frankly and listen openly are fundamental if the synod is to be a process of discernment. You see, he's always coming back on that teaching us how to become a synodal church. And he continues, discernment is not an advertising slogan. It is not an organizational technique or a fad of this pontificate, but an interior attitude rooted in an act of faith. Discernment is the method and at the same time, the goal we set ourselves. It is based on the, convic the conviction that God is at work in the world today in life's events, in the people I meet and who, I, who speak to me. For this reason, we are called to listen to what the Spirit suggests to us, which methods and in paths that are often unpredictable. Discernment needs space and time. And so during the work done in plenary assembly and in groups, after five interventions are made, a moment of silence of approximately three minutes will be observed. That's where I picked that up to do with my priests. This is to allow everyone to recognize within their hearts the nuances of what they have heard and to allow everyone to reflect deeply and seize upon what is most striking. This attention to interiority is the key to accomplishing the work of recognizing interpreting and choosing. Well, with the guidance of the Holy Father's remarks, we set out to experience that synod in a new way. I felt that in our sharing groups, things were very different. We did more than express our ideas and defend them. We truly learned to listen to others. Sometimes our views would shift, more nuanced, we learned as we listen profoundly, truthfully, to adjust and maybe see that our ideas were not the best. And that is how we learned to discern. 
Pope Francis also said this, let us leave behind prejudice and stereotypes. A first step towards listening is to free our minds and our hearts from prejudice and stereotypes. When we think we already know what who others are and what they want, we really struggle to listen to them seriously. Relations across generations are a terrain in which prejudice and stereotypes take root and proverbial use uh, with proverbial ease, so much so that we are often oblivious to it. Young people are tempted to consider adults outdated. Adults are tempted to regard young people as inexperienced, to know how they are and especially how they should be and behave. All of this can be an overwhelming obstacle to dialogue and to the encounter between generations. Most, most of those present do not belong to a younger generation, so it is clear that we must pay attention, above all, to the risk of talking about young people in categories and ways of thinking that are already outmoded. If we can avoid this risk, then we will help to bridge generations. Adults should overcome the temptation to underestimate the abilities of young people and not judge them negatively. As the Holy Father participated in the two synods since his election, he clearly noticed that we were not listening enough to the Lord, to his spirit, and listening to each other profoundly. At the Council of Jerusalem, some very difficult questions were raised that could have compromised the mission of the church and could have divided the disciples and impeded the realization of the missionary mandate. Circumcision, yes or no? It's part of the law. What are we to do? Some foods are not suitable for us to eat. That's clear in what we have learned. But what do we do with these people outside of our inner circle who are not familiar with our traditions? It was by listening to each other, listening and praying to the Holy Spirit and focusing on what is essential that the followers of Christ at the beginning of the church were able to find the path to go on forward. The guidance of the Holy Spirit led them to focus on what is essential and move on. That is why I'm not surprised that Pope Francis decided to offer the whole church the opportunity to experience a synod on synodality so that we can all participate and experience what synodality is and how we are called to live as a church so as to live out our mission. The theme Pope Francis has chosen, as you know, is for a synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. I've been asked to speak to you on going forth a missionary church synodality, mission, and evangelization. My lengthy introduction had a precise purpose, to bring us to clearly understand that mission and evangelization are, only, are not only about what we do, but who we are and what we are together. Of course, our ministry, our mission, whether it be ecclesial or in the midst of the world, is expressed by what we do but most importantly, by who we are and how we live out our mission, our ministry with others. I do believe that Pope Francis's intuition is that we need to learn how to live, to live as a people of God who walks together in communion with full participation. Only that can lead us to a fruitful mission. We often say that the church has a mission, but I believe, as others have stated, that we could also say that the mission has a church. When I was appointed Archbishop of Quebec in 2011, at my first press conference, many of the questions with which the journalists bombarded me pertained to empty churches, Catholics that have abandoned the faith, abandoned the practice. Archbishop, I've heard you talk about the million Catholics in your diocese of Quebec, one said, and the 240 parish communities. Let's face it, very few of those are churchgoers. How are you going to bring back these people to fill your empty churches? 
my answer stunned them. I said, the, fo- the Holy Father has not appointed me with the mission of filling church pews, but to bring my brothers and sisters of our diocese to encounter Jesus, the living God who introduces us to abundant life. That is the first step. Excuse me. That is the first step, the decisive one. Encountering Jesus is the foundation to build on. Then we can have with them living communities of faith. I love to quote, I love to quote Pope Benedict XVI, who wrote in his first encyclical on the love of God, in first paragraph. We have come to believe in God's love. In these words, the Christian can express the fundamental decision of his life. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person who gives life a new horizon in a a decisive direction. The encounter with a person, Jesus Christ which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. It seems to me that this is what we need to focus on. That is our mission, our passion, our life, bringing people to the encounter that can change their life forever as it has changed ours. I think we can agree that this is essential, necessary, necessary in the life of the church. We are all for this, but the big question is how are we going to accomplish this today, tomorrow, and together? The challenges are important as we are not only in a time of deep change, as Pope Francis says, in the world and in the church, but also a change of era. Like the disciples needed to come together to agree, I'm sorry. Somebody's trying to reach me on FaceTime. I'm sorry. Like the disciples needed to come together to address these challenges in the first years of the life of the church, we too need to come together to implore the light and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And also, and not least, we need to listen to each other, brothers and sisters in Christ. Missionary disciples cannot be lone rangers that do their thing as self-employed workers in the vineyard of the Lord. We have been listening all through the Paschal season, pages of the Acts of the Apostles, that bring forth the experience of how the mission of the church evolved in the first Christian communities. Everywhere we see the disciples of Jesus Christ work together, share the mission, supporting each other, working out difficulties, discerning how to move together. Pope Francis sees this and sees that this is what we need to do now. If we do not live in communion with the Lord and with each other, if we do not seek full participation of the people of God, we will not be able to live out our mission. We could easily get caught up in sterile, polarizing, and paralyzing debates that only divide us and ultimately become a scandal, a counter witness for the world. We are called to witness to the new life in Jesus Christ in the midst of this world, and we need to do this together as a unified community of believers. Jesus' words to his disciples are strong and challenging. This is how all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. How will we come to live this concretely in our daily lives, in our families, our parish communities, groups, dioceses? The Holy Father has invited us to sit down and experience this synod on synodality. Let's take the pulse of the church. Is there enough oxygen in our blood? Enough love and charity in our arteries and veins and hearts and in our relationships? Who are we listening to? The Holy Spirit, the Word of God, or just ourselves in our way of seeing things and thinking? The guidelines that 
we have received from the Secretariat of the Synod in Rome to present our diocesan reports for this first portion of the Synod do not ask us to define what the important themes that we need to clarify to live out the mission of the church, but to share how we are living as a synodal church. What we have discovered in our way of living together as disciples of Jesus Christ. Is there really communion, participation, or maybe not enough? How can we grow together? Those are the essential steps to be able to exercise, live our mission. As a member of the Council of the Synod of Bishops, we have frequent meetings in Rome. Uh, luckily, in the past year or two, uh, by Zoom. We have meetings to share how all of this is evolving in the Universal Church. As soon as we begin, we began this first synodal experience last October, we began receiving papers from many individuals and groups that express what they needed to see change in the church. Some wonderful ideas, but more frequently than not, there were papers that expressed one person's personal view or one group's personal view but it had not been shared with others, with anyone. Or a group focused on a subject, but not shared with other groups. The secretariat sent these papers back to their authors and invited them to share this with their local church and not only to express their views, which is legitimate. We need to hear what they have to say, but they also need to listen to what others have to say. We need to be together. This is where communion and participation can lead to mission. If we do not reach this level of sharing and listening to one another and to the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to give a credible witness to the world and live out our mission. Christopher Wright wrote, and I quote, It is not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission, God's mission. That is why we need to be together, united in communion, listening to each other, discerning to advance on the path of evangelization. As we very well see on the ground level, this is not an easy, as easy as it seems to accomplish. It calls for a profound conversion of each one of us. And that is something we cannot accomplish by ourselves. We need the help from above and we the help, need the help from around us, from our brothers and sisters. A missionary priest, an oblate of Mary Immaculate, Father Jarek Pachow, Pachowki, wrote these words that I find inspiring and challenging. And I quote, our mission has never been to fill buildings, as tempting and satisfying as this might have been, but rather to reach the people wherever they are, to go beyond the walls. Throughout the centuries, the way of being the church has changed accordingly to the reality of the social environment. In the beginning, first Christians gathered in homes, often in secret due to persecution. In the Middle Ages, beautiful cathedrals, which are real pieces of art, were built across the European countries as places of gathering and worship. Then the Second Vatican Council updated the liturgy and understanding of the church in the modern times. And now the COVID-19 pandemic brings us into a new phase of being the church. As much as there is a temptation and sentiment that one day things will go back to normal, the reality is there is no way back. The only way is to move forward. The way we gather as church might have changed throughout history, but the mission has never changed. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I purposely chose not to go any further to propose recipes or strategies for evangelization. Of course, that is necessary. 
But foremost, we need to experience profoundly the first two steps that suggest the theme of the synod, communion and participation. If we do not work on those two major ways of living as a church, as the people of God, we will not be able to live the missionary mandate that we receive from the Lord. I see these challenges in my own diocese. In the past 10 years, we have been working intensely on becoming a missionary church. It's been a very long road. We had a plan, a very good one, if I may say so. Well-written, logical, the right steps, with all the necessary steps to make this happen. But we have encountered major difficulties. Because we do not listen enough to each other, to the word of God, to the Holy Spirit, it is difficult to come together and embrace a common mission. Of course, we can see some wonderful experiences, some communities and pastoral teams that are making wonderful progress, but we must recognize that there are still, that we are still far from being a missionary community, adequately organized to face the challenges of this moment in history. We've tried almost everything, so many good ideas from other churches or groups, but until we become fully a synodal church, it will be difficult to accomplish fully our mission in sharing the gospel to all those entrusted to us. Now, hear me well, I am not discouraged, but challenged. With our diocesan team, we continue to pray and work to lead our diocesan community in this direction. We made a list recently of all the ongoing formation that has been given in, the past, given in the past decade on the subject of mission and evangelization in our diocese, on the transformation of our parish communities. We had four pages listing all the good events that we prepared and offered to our people. Why haven't we put all of this in practice? We hear many Catholics say, you know, I am a Catholic, but not a practicing Catholic. Many of us could say that we are missionary disciples, but non-practicing missionary disciples. Why are we putting this off for later? We believe this is necessary. We need to come to this, but we can't seem to come together and allow the needed changes in our way of living and being in our ministry. The synod, my brothers and sisters, could be a transforming experience that could lead us to the conversion we need. Experience is the correct word. We don't need another document, but an experience that brings us together, that will focus our energy, our resources, our lives at the service of the mission of the church. A church experience that will help lead us to a new mentality, a new way of serving together. I hope and pray that this will happen. We are learning to walk together. Not everyone is following yet, but we have not abandoned the journey. This is work in progress. And the Holy Father is supporting us, giving us tools to be able to come to this. I continue to dream about a missionary church where all baptized are much more than consumers in the pews, but empowered witnesses in the midst of the world, aware and engaged in the mission of evangelization, where so many brothers and sisters are in need of the hope and light that Christ brings. May the Lord, through this synod, ever more closer to that goal. May he bring us ever more closer to that goal. I truly believe that for this to come about, we must seriously embrace this synodal process and incorporate it in our way of being church. This is not something we need to add. This is something we need to become. This is what will lead us to become a missionary church that evangelizes.
Thank you very much, Cardinal Lacroix. At this time, we're going to uh, ask David Daler and perhaps Michelle Dabrowski to moderate uh, some questions that have come up in the Q&A box. So we'll um, turn it over to you, David. Thank you, Mark. Cardinal, there have been a number of questions and a lot of them have to do with the synodal process itself. Uh, but the first one that came up was to deal with the reports and the publications and the results, wanting to know that as these reports are brought in, how, how will people be aware or how will they know um, what is being moved forward? Is, is there any, any uh, process in place uh, that, that's going to share the results of the, of the local data? Sure. You know, every diocese can share what they have experienced in their own diocese. We will bring this to our national conference. In our region, the Quebec bishops, we will bring it to our regional assembly, and this will come together. Uh, as I said, you know, we're not looking here for the themes to change the church, uh, the big themes that are always on the board and which are important. We need to come to that. But the Holy Father feels that we need to experience this so it can change who we are on ground level. So uh, I know in, in my diocese, we're bringing all of this together, all the experiences that we've been through in, since last October. We're not, we're not over yet. We're not done yet. But uh, we'll be ready to share in our diocese. Well, this is what we heard. This is how we already are at Synodal Church. This is what we learned through doing this. This is where we need to go in, in, the, in, in synodality. The big difficulty has been people want to move on to the other step and not doing the synodal process. We want to say, okay, we need to ordain women. We need to, we need to, 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 to marry priests. We need to, to change this. That can only come after. So uh, those who are expecting those kind of results will, be, uh, will not be very satisfied, but we cannot move on to these subjects until we really are sure that we can listen to each other and listen seriously profoundly to each other and be together. We can be very far apart, but if we learn to listen to each other and listen to the Holy Spirit, that's where we'll be able to, to move along. So uh, our reports will be, uh, for our diocese, 10 pages is all we need. An introduction, what the experience has been, what we've discovered, uh, where we want to go, and a conclusion. That's where we are right now. And an extended part of that same question, when we reach the point of the Synod in 2023, um, there's a question as to whether, is the synodal process going to be reflected there? Traditionally, the Synod would be the bishops that would gather and that would discuss. At this point, there's really only one voting woman that, that sits at, at the Synod. Um, how are the voices, and I think I know the answer to it, but how are the voices of those that feel disenfranchised and excluded, how are they going to be heard at that gathering? Is it only through the reports or do you think the, the Pope will engage other voices around the table? Well, in the three synods I have participated in, uh, there are always many people around the table, depending on the theme. I mean, I, the last one with youth, we had a good, good proportion of, of, of young people who participated. They were able to express themselves at the same length as bishops and cardinals in the, the, the linguistic groups they were sharing. We had 40 hours uh, to share among ourselves. It was very, very rich. The question of the voting is something that's still not clear yet. What is clear for the Holy Father, and he stated that to our, to our synod council that is preparing this synod, there are levels of responsibility in the church. Uh, this is not a, a debate that, like a democracy, but uh, if we are sure that people are listened to at every stage and participate in all stages, uh, that's, what, that's what we're aiming for. Will there be a vote or no more votes at the end of the synod? We don't know yet. The Holy Father can surprise us. I don't have the answer to that question. I wish I did, but I think we're still working on that. And uh, some people think uh, we should eliminate the vote at the end. Uh, others say, no, what we vote are suggestions. The Holy Father is the last one who 
has the final discernment. But the bishops have a role in leadership and discernment also, the, the rest of the people of God also. So what is really uh, very present this time is that the whole of the people of God participate in all this first process, this first part, which has never been done. You know, like when we have a theme, a special theme, well, we look at a few experts and people who are considered by this theme, and we ask them to answer questions. And then we pull that together and send it. This is something else. And it's not, I think the fruits are not just what we're going to send to Rome and to the, 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 the conference. It's what we'll have experienced and learned and become is already a, a great fruit. Excellent. Michelle, are there, is there a French question? Je n'ai pas encore vu une question en français, alors j'avais mis un petit... Uh... No, that's right. <laughs> there's two Michelles. So, there... <laughs> so there's Michelle Lecote doing, a doing the interpretation and myself. So between the two of us, uh, we can help with the... But there, as uh, Michelle said, uh, there's no French questions yet, but feel free to use the, the Q&A to put in your questions in French or in English. Thanks, Michelle. There's, there's a a challenging question that comes around the uh, reconciliation. Um, and the media is is always making it very difficult and seems to say that the, the perception is that, that we aren't listening and that the conference doesn't listen. Is Are the bishops using the synodal model or the process itself on the road to reconciliation uh, with our Indigenous brothers and sisters? Can you speak to that at all? Mm. That's a very good question. Very interesting question. We have participated in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in listening circles. I'll speak for myself here in Quebec. In my diocese, we did not have any residential schools, but we have some, some natives who have been to residential schools in other regions. And we have had listening circles where some bishops have been, we, see, we, we sat for a whole day listening to their experiences. We listen not only when we do those listening circles, but we continue to be present. I have here in my parish, in my diocese, in the city of Quebec, uh, here in Wendat community, we're in, continually in dialogue. And, in, uh, and I think it's, that's the way it is in most parts of the country where there are natives, whether they be uh, uh, Inuits or Métis or uh, of the native peoples. And... Uh, I think we're, we're listening a lot more than they they think we are. We're really on ground zero with our people and uh, and listening and walking. We're walking together. That's what the theme of the uh, of the Pope's visit will be: walking together. We've been trying to do that. There were some some bad steps, and we made mistakes. Of course, that's recognized, and we're working to reconcile that. But the fact that in most communities we continue to walk together and serve and, 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 and live our faith with our people is already a sign that we continue to walk and listen. Uh, this is a long process is when people. Oh, oh the Cardinal is frozen. Uh, I look at what the, the Conference of Catholic Bishops of Canada has done in these past years with, uh, with uh, a group of bishops, especially mandated to work and to prepare the delegation to Rome that went to late March and beginning of April, how they're working now to prepare this papal visit. There's a lot of listening and respect. So I think we've grown in that aspect. Excellent. There's, there's a rather long, uh, complex question about next steps, um, but it's, it's something that, that you may have some insight into. When, when we talk about finishing this process, this part of the process, um, it, it's, it's very clear that Pope Francis says this is not a one-shot deal, that it, it's an ongoing process, and that we're, our, our intent is how the church becomes more synodal. But the question is, are there, do you think there will be resources that will come out soon for next steps, what dioceses and parishes could, could do to embrace as they move forward uh, from the synodal process, or will we have to wait until the end of 2023? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, well, I could say this from my local perspective, we're already started sharing our best practices. 
what's happening in our in one parish, one group. Oh, look, they did this. This was, you know, we did we did something a few weeks ago inviting uh, uh, ecumenical uh, brothers and sisters. We had three pastors from three different non-Catholic uh, churches share how they live synodality and how they governed and how they discerned and how they how they did this with their people. So we're sharing this with another diocese. Uh, we said, oh, we, we had not thought of doing that. We could do that also. And, and in our parishes, some pastors, some pastoral teams, lay associates have ideas. And so we've developed a uh, uh, kind of an inside newsletter between ourselves, between parishes and groups to say, what well, we did this and this really was good. Uh, we started this way. We had to adjust. So we're helping each other. So let's not just wait for a document from Rome. We can learn a lot in our local uh, region, but also I think as a as a, as a province, as a, an assembly, as a conference, as a nation, we can we can learn a lot from this. I'm sure that what will come out of our reports uh, will be very helpful, and we'll have there a lot of a lot of good stuff to say. Wow, I haven't thought thought of that. Why didn't I think of it, you know? But, uh, and we can share with others and learn from others. This is what synodality is all about. I think that's that's an excellent example. As I know in our own diocese that right now we're in the middle of a, a process called moving forward together in yeah. Christ. And that's our response that uh, that our bishop and, and the team is taking to where we go next. Mm. So I think we will see that in individual dioceses. I think Michelle has a French question for you. Oui, en fait, il y a deux, deux petites questions, je vais les mettre ensemble, mais la première partie, c'est, bon, nous avons fait un exercice de synodalité dans notre paroisse, mais l'objectif est de devenir une église synodale. Euh, comment passer de l'exercice de synodalité à une communauté de syn synodale? Je trouve que c'est une bonne question et je, je vous aussi attacher une, une deuxième question, comment discerner si une diocèse, une paroisse, une communauté ne va pas dans peut-être une bonne direction, ou le discernement, euh, sur, ou trouver une bonne direction, ou changer euh, le chemin, si, si ça ne va pas super mmh. bien. Voilà, mmh. alors deux petites mmh. questions. Bon, moi, je pense que ça dépend, ça dépend beaucoup pour votre première question, Michel. Si on veut juste accomplir une tâche et répondre à un questionnaire parce que l'Église nous demande de, de, de vivre ça, ça va donner combien d'autres choses? On va répondre et puis voilà. Mais si on, on, on prend ça comme l'Église nous le demande, le Saint-Père nous l'offre comme une opportunité de changement, une opportunité pour se laisser questionner. Moi, il y a des, des façons de faire dans ma façon d'être évêque, d'être pasteur de ce diocèse de Québec, qui ont évolué euh, pas seulement depuis, depuis le mois d'octobre parce qu'on est en synode, mais à être confronté et à rencontrer des frères et sœurs laïcs, vie consacrée, des gens dans les milieux, des, des, mes confrères prêtres, mes confrères évêques. On se questionne et si on accepte de se laisser questionner et on s'écoute vraiment, pas pour se justifier, mais pour dire, si tu euh, n'avais si pas vu ça de cette façon-là, de toujours penser qu'on peut apprendre des autres, ça va déjà être quelque chose qui va nous transformer. Mais il faut être patient. Il faut être très patient. On n'a pas l'habitude de changer très rapidement. Il faut, il faut toujours demeurer. Nous, ce qui nous aide beaucoup, là, depuis le début de la pandémie, on a beaucoup intensifié les petits groupes de partage de la parole de Dieu, ce qu'on appelle des maisonnées. Six, sept, huit, dix personnes. Au début, ils le faisaient sur Zoom. Il y en a qui continuent sur Zoom ou FaceTime. D'autres se réunissent dans leur maison maintenant que c'est possible. Mais on se met ensemble à l'écoute de la parole de Dieu, du texte de l'Évangile du dimanche qui, 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 qui approche, et on écoute ce que le Seigneur nous dit, puis on partage de nos vies. C'est merveilleux comme ça nous rassemble et ça nous envoie à la mission. Et, et ça, c'est un chemin synodal aussi. Hein? Alors ça, c'est pour nous une façon. Maintenant, euh, il y a des milieux qui n'ont pas beaucoup embarqué dans ce processus. Ça ne se force pas, ça. On ne peut pas le forcer, on peut inviter, comme il y a peut-être des diocèses dans le monde qui ont dit, ben, on n'a pas le temps pour ça. Hein? On entend ça des fois dans nos réunions à Rome, qu'on partage un peu ce qui se passe dans nos régions, dans nos, dans nos, dans nos pays. Euh, il y en a qui disent, ben, moi, j'ai quelques diocèses qui ont dit, on verra ça plus tard, on n'a pas le temps. Pourtant, s'ils savaient comment ça pourrait nous aider dans ce qu'on vit actuellement, à changer dans nos attitudes, notre façon de faire, pour mieux vivre notre mission et de le vivre ensemble, de se soutenir ensemble, 
à la lumière de l'esprit, je pense qu'on aurait, euh, ça nous aiderait. Mais ça ne se force pas, il faut être patient. Donner le goût, peut-être qu'en nous voyant vivre, on va leur donner le goût. Oui, absolument. Oui, c'est merci beaucoup. Je trouve c'est bien. Je vais retourner à, à David parce que j'ai vu quelques autres questions qui ont rentré. Oui. David, back to you. Okay, back to me. All right. Um, now, we're, we're getting near the end of the questions. I, I have... A good I thing. Say, I, <laughs> I wanted to save this one until the very end. So, if, Michelle, was there anything else that you had to, that you wanted to bring up? That was All right. Fine. There was a question that came. I'll just go back and scroll back to it. This was a question to Cardinal Quad. This is not about synodality, but it's something they always wanted to ask you. Um, that we, she knows that you're the Archbishop of Quebec and the Archbishop's the primate of Canada, because that's the seat of the North American First Diocese. But what does that mean exactly? And how does this differ from the role of, of other archbishops? Recently, she listened to a talk by the late uh, Father Benedict Gorshel, who lamented the fact that the church in the U.S. doesn't have a primate. So there must be some significance. And she wonders if you could just tell us, and she said, apologies for not asking about the synod but she'd like to know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Listen, uh, the title of Primate of Canada is simply the church recognizing that the Diocese of Quebec is the first, first diocese to be established in North America, north of Mexico, and the Spanish colonies. So uh, originally, the Diocese of Quebec, which was established in 1674, We'll be celebrating in 224 our 350th anniversary. Uh, the Diocese of Quebec was the largest, geographically speaking, in the world. It was all of Canada and all of the United States, up to the uh, uh, Spanish colonies down south and the New England states. All the rest was the, the Diocese of Quebec. And so in 1956, Uh, the Pope decided to recognize that historical fact and to recognize the Church of Quebec. Uh, and that is why the United States cannot have a primate. Because if they had one, it would be me. But it's not the thing to do. They have a premier see, which is Baltimore, their first diocese. But it was part of our diocese at the, at the beginning, as was Louisiana. We went right down to the Gulf of Mexico. Louisiana was part of my diocese. I, I've been invited a few times to Louisiana to celebrate the 200th anniversary of a parish because it was part of my diocese. Anyway, but this being said, this honorary title gives me absolutely no authority on anyone else. It's a historical and it's a, it's a recognition of what our diocese is and the, the role it plays in the church. So I, I'm not the boss of the bishops of Canada. It doesn't, in, it doesn't increase my salary. It doesn't, uh, nothing like that. But on a civil level, it is recognized as a person of importance before the government of Canada, after the governor general and, and a few others, the primate of Canada has a special spot in the protocol in the, well, it doesn't, uh, It's not something, something that, changes, uh, that changes the world, but it's a, a recognition that in this country of ours, Canada, Quebec, was the first, uh, first diocese. So it's, that's what it means. And I'm very proud to be the 25th Bishop of Quebec after our first bishop, who was Saint Francois de Laval, a great missionary and a great saint uh, who lived in a very synodal way. He's a... Uh, he, uh, He was very influenced by the Council of Trent and the pastoral and apostolic activity that the Council of Trent wanted to put forth. He wasn't a father of the Council because it was a hundred years before him, but that missionary spirit, that pastoral outreach for parishes, when he came to Canada, that's how he lived this. That's how he, he built and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the diocese of Quebec, his large diocese as a missionary diocese. So that's what the primate, and now be very careful how you pronounce that word. It's not primate, it's primate. <laughs> There's a big difference. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Bishop. Over to you, Cardinal, over to you, Mark. 
Thank you very much, David. And uh, again, Cardinal Lacroix, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bishop Crosby now, who's going to uh, bring greetings to you. Just an opportunity uh, to, to thank you uh, very much, uh, Your Eminence, for, for a, a wonderful presentation, a very interesting presentation. You're a, you're a great teacher and, and your, open, your open attitude, your, your, your spirit of synodality, uh, the, the, the stories that you recounted, uh, the personal stories, the personal experiences you recounted, the, the experiences that you've had with synods has really given us insight and uh, helped us understand the process. And the fact that you start started really with the Great Commission, you know, uh, go out to all nations and proclaim the good news, that you put it in the context of mission, that this is how we discern our mission. We, we listen, we pray, we discern how we move forward, and we are... We are in this process now. So it was a very interesting uh, and, and, uh, and joyful presentation. Your spirit shone through, and, uh, and I just, on behalf of everybody, I thank you very much for the work you put into, into this uh, presentation. But I know that it comes out of a, a lifetime of lived synodality. So, Great to have you, and, and thank you for responding, yes. Merci beaucoup pour votre indulgence. It was wonderful to share, very humbly. I'm not a, uh, but I, I'm very happy to, to have been able to share. I wish I could have seen all of you and, and met all of you personally, but we're in this together, and let's continue walking, walking together, and uh, the Lord will do something very good with us. That's where the hope is. Merci beaucoup. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Bishop Crosby. Uh, so as we um, bring our session to a close, this three, three week uh, cycle that we've been following, um, we really have been walking uh, a synodal path together. And uh, we've learned that a synodal church results when communi communion, participation, and mission work together. Remember, sisters, um, uh, sprockets that we're all working together. We are grateful to Dr. Maureen McQueen, Mr. David Daler, Sister Chantal Demaray, and of course, His Eminence Cardinal Lacroix for sharing in their insights and wisdom. They have inspired us to walk together to listen and discern our way forward as a church. This fall, the Commission for Evangelization and Catechesis plans to offer a new webinar series. And tomorrow we'll send you a short evaluation of this series and your feedback will help us in our planning going forward. So we really appreciate it if you would take time to answer it. Brandon tells me it'll only take you two minutes, but you're welcome to take longer if you wish. So I wish you a good summer. Uh, I encourage you to remember the words of Sister Chantal, who said, uh, the goal is not to have a synod, but to be a synod. And finally, the words of Cardinal Lacroix, let's walk together, let's walk forward together. Thank you very much, everyone. See you next time. Bye.